Hello and welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Vivian Allred, naturopathic nutritional therapist and hormone enthusiast. If you want to learn how to rebalance your female hormones, regulate your menstrual cycle and reclaim your vitality, then you are in the right place. Each week I will be delving into different conditions such as PCOS, endometriosis, infertility, hypothyroidism, acne and hair loss. Stay tuned for interviews with expert guests, Q&As and solo episodes that are all intended to help you move from hormonal chaos to hormonal harmony. If you'd like to submit a question for me to answer on the podcast, then you can email them to hormonesinharmony at gmail.com. The information shared on this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and is not designed to replace the advice of your health practitioner. That said, let's get into today's episode. Welcome back to episode five. I am so excited to share this podcast with you. I'm joined by Dr. Felice Gersh, who is an OBGYN and expert in the PCOS field. I first heard her speak at the Gestational Summit conference in London in 2018, and ever since I've just been obsessed with her work and I've learned so much from her, especially in this interview. And I wanted her to dig deep into some topics that aren't really covered because they are so important and she's so passionate about PCOS, partly due to her own experience and struggles in early adulthood. From the moment I hit record on this podcast, she was just on fire, just dropping knowledge bombs. She's such an incredible wealth of knowledge and I just love the work that she's putting out into the world and her approach to hormones, nutrition and also PCOS in particular. In this podcast episode, we discuss how Dr. Gersh transitioned from a conventional medicine practitioner to a more holistic, functional approach. We discuss the harmful effects of the birth control pill, especially for women with PCOS, why our hormones are connected to moon cycles and light exposure, why PCOS is actually an estrogen deficient state, not an estrogen dominant state like we're currently taught, and the massive connection between gut health, our microbiome and PCOS. Hi, Felice. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to join you here today to talk about my passion, polycystic ovary syndrome. Yeah, and ever since I heard you speak at the event in London, I could just tell that you were so passionate about this like I am, and I needed to speak to you again. I've got tons of questions following your presentation, and I find myself constantly going back to the the lecture notes and reviewing it all because you covered so much amazing information so I, I want to delve into some of the topics that you covered on this interview today. Could you share your story of how you got into gynecology and PCOS and specifically the functional approach to things? Well way back when I was growing up my parents basically gave me a choice of three careers and and I just accepted that was what it was so it was teacher, lawyer or doctor and I thought I'm pretty good at science. I think I'll be a doctor. So sometimes it's easier when you have a limited menu to make choices, right? (laughs) So I chose doctor, but then I had the complete universe of what to do with that field because there's so many ways that you can be a doctor. So while I was in medical school, well, I had, even from a teenager, I developed very significant acne and my mom took me to a dermatologist and they really had nothing that seemed to help. It was And this is a long time ago as well. Not that it's so great today either, but it was even less then. And so there was really nothing that was helping. And I didn't know what to do because it just, I just hated it. And thinking that my skin must not be clean enough, that must be the cause. I didn't know what was going on. I took alcohol and I would scrub my face with alcohol and it would just crack. And then I would have all this cracking skin and all the pimples. It was just terrible. And I said, I have to, you know, try to figure this out, not just for myself, but for for others who suffer with this. And then um, I started having really irregular cycles. And when I was in medical school, I was about halfway through, I went to one of the very um, prestigious doctors in the OBGYN department of my medical school. And I went for an appointment as a patient. And I said, Dr. XX, um, I haven't had a period in two years. And he said, well, that sounds pretty good. You know, you don't have to have deal with periods, just go on birth control pills. And I said, but isn't there something wrong with me? And he said, well, don't even worry about it. You know, just go on birth control pills. And I said, 
but I would like to have kids sometime. And he said, worry about it then. And it's like, God. this is not, <laughs> this cannot be the answer. And I think that was when I decided to go into OBGYN because I had to figure this out. I needed some more information that I was getting. And, and I, so I did. I actually went, I, I loved delivering babies. I loved the excitement of the field. It was very varied. I got to do deliveries. I got to do surgeries, but I had long-term, I could have long-term patient relationships because I also would have an office practice. It seemed like the best of all worlds. I hadn't really thought that I would never sleep, but that I, I just didn't really consider that aspect with the OB part. But I went into it. And then for the next Oh, 25 years, I practiced very conventional OBGYN myself, but I always knew there was more to taking care of women than just the conventional approach, which is really pharmaceuticals and surgeries. And so from the very beginning of my practice, I incorporated what I call my ancillaries. I had a Chinese medicine practitioner, a nutritionist, um, a, a psychologist rather, and I had at one point a biofeedback specialist. I've had massage therapists. So I've always had full, a full array of sort of um, alternative medicine type practitioners to really complement what I could do. But I myself had no special additional training and I believed the party line for so long. In fact, I considered myself the most cutting edge doctor. I would learn about every new surgical procedure. I taught surgery at the University of Southern California School of Medicine. So I would learn about every new surgical device, everything that came out, every new pharmaceutical. And I was what you might call an early adapter. I would use everything right out the box. You know, it's like I would be the first on the block to use it. And then I would teach other doctors how to use it. And then over the years, I saw problems. Like I would use medical device and so I would not work right. And I would report it to the company and there'd be problems and, and then they would do nothing. And then years later, it would get taken off the market, like the morselator and a lot of meshes and some of the um, things that you would stick into a woman, like these gels that were supposed to reduce adhesions, but would cause massive inflammation, exactly the opposite, you know, and allergic responses. And pharmaceuticals, one by one, they would get blocked black box labels, you know, like warnings get taken off the market. And it's like, and, but, you know, something seemed really wrong. And then a, a little over a decade ago, like 11 years ago, it was my time to stop doing obstetrics. I had lived with chronic sleep deprivation for so many years that I just said, okay, I have to stop. And then I, maybe part of me woke up and I demanded that all the pharmaceutical reps that paraded through my office had to show me their original studies to show how their drug got approved. And I wanted to see the full array of side effects versus benefits. And as I looked through all the pharmaceuticals, um, it was like a hammer hitting me on the head. It was like, oh my gosh, the difference between the placebo or you know the control arm and the actual pharmaceutical was often very nominal. They would take a graph and then they would blow it up to show some kind of difference between the two lines. But in reality, there was almost no difference at all. And then they would fudge stuff and there was you know, just ridiculousness. And the side effects would outweigh any potential benefits whatsoever, but they of course would never talk about that. And they would never talk about you know, natural ways, obviously as a comparison for the treatment. And then the more I learned about birth control pills, the more I, well, came to hate them because <laughs> I understood that, of course, they were not hormones at all. And they called them a hormonal contraception when they were really like anti-hormonal contraception. And I started taking more and more courses and searching. And I felt at that point completely lost because I didn't feel like, you know, I wasn't doing deliveries anymore. So I didn't have that sort of a positivity in my life that was gone. And I was tired of just doing surgery because that's like most of that is end stage disease, like hysterectomies and you're taking out organs and I respect organs. I think they should be left in place. And then here I am taking out organs and I had, that's like not being very proactive. And so I really went on a search and I started going to naturopathic meetings and I just felt like a total like middle age medical crisis. <laughs> And I was at one meeting and there was a one MD and I was the only other MD, everyone else was a naturopathic doctor. And I went up to her and I said, Dr. Lodog, I'm completely lost. I don't know what my purpose is anymore. 
because I just can't just keep prescribing these pharmaceuticals. Everything, the solution to every female problem seems to be put her on birth control pills and they're not dealing with what the problem is. You're just trying to cover it up with something that's actually toxic. How can this be appropriate? And she said, "My, I'm the director of the fellowship of integrative medicine at the University of Arizona School of Medicine. The new session starts in two weeks. You know, clearly after talking to you, you're qualified. Why don't you apply and do that? And so I went home. I was in Portland, Oregon. I flew home to Southern California. I filled out the application. Two weeks later, I was in Tucson, and I never looked back. I finished that two-year fellowship, and that was in 2012. I became board certified in integrative medicine. I'm one of a tiny handful of board certified OBGYNs who are also board certified in integrative medicine. And I've never stopped learning and taking courses. And now I actually am lecturing all over the world, as, as you know. And you know, PCOS is something that I ended up self-diagnosing in myself because nobody else did. And that still is not rare today that women with PCOS can see multiple doctors and not get the diagnosis. But even when they get the diagnosis, they don't get really any effective therapy. And often what they get is something that can actually, in some ways, and often many ways, make them worse. So I've changed the whole focus of my practice, my whole life. And it's been a wonderful new path that I'm on, helping women to access their own innate mechanisms to heal and looking at the total woman, right? So we don't just look at one little piece. We don't look at just, we, we, and then one of the key things and that every woman should know is that her whole body, now women, humans do not have to go and have unlimited number of babies, right? We don't. We're the only species on the planet that actually tries to control our reproduction and that we try to limit the number of babies that we have. And I am certainly not advocating that every woman should have unlimited babies without any control. But we do have to understand our bodies. And all women have bodies that are really designed and focused on reproduction because that's true for all animals, all female creatures, no matter what type of creature they are, their bodies are designed for procreation. And you cannot separate reproductive functions from all the other functions of the female body. They're all completely intertwined. It's one. So if you try to segregate off reproduction, like you create a wall and you just separate that off from the rest of the body, that cannot be. You can't do that. It's all connected. And once we understand that we are one body, we are one whole, then we can understand that when a woman with PCOS has reproductive issues, she has entire body, whole body, metabolic problems. Metabolism is the force of life. It's the creation, distribution, and everything that has to do with energy, which is really the force of life. That That's why women with PCOS are so complex, that but we in, in the conventional medical world, which I have a foot in, but I'm trying to change it. That's why I keep my foot in it, because I want to have an impact among the massive numbers of conventional doctors as well as the ones who are, we'll say, more enlightened. And um, <laughs> that we cannot poison reproduction in women and think the rest of their bodies will con con to continue humming along. And women who have reproductive problems have whole body problems. And we can't just try to cover up those reproductive problems and think we're not really doing anything, that we are not doing anything good for the whole body. So women with PCOS are amazing in how complex they are. But once you understand and put it all together, then suddenly there's so much hope to really have resolution and repair of every aspect of her body. And that's a long story, but it's, it's really, um, it's been a journey for me, as you can see, to get to where I am now. Definitely. That was amazing. Uh, everything you said, I totally agree with everything. And you've had the experience of seeing both sides of the story from the conventional view and from the more holistic functional approach. So I think that's what makes you such an amazing practitioner and such a wealth of knowledge. 
Just touching back on the subject of the birth control pill, what is it in particular that you find to be detrimental for women with both PCOS or just hormone imbalances in general? Well, first you need to start with what is a birth control pill? What's in it? So people talk about it as hormonal contraception, but if you look at the ingredients and you go like in the US to the US National Institutes of Health Toxicology website, it lists the ingredients of birth control pills as endocrine disruptors. So endocrine disruptors are any chemical that can interfere with any aspect of a hormone, its production, its distribution, its receptor function, its degradation, and its elimination. So basically, it can interfere in any one of a myriad of ways with the way that hormone should exist in the body. So that's what birth control pills are. And after all, that is what they were designed to do. They were designed to interfere with the normal hormones of a female so that she cannot reproduce. So what what exactly do they do? Well, First of all, they completely shut down the normal, beautiful rhythms of a woman. So women are so amazing in their rhythms. They have circadian rhythms. That's the 24-hour rhythm that's related to the rotation of Earth on its axis. And then there are the ultradian rhythm. That's the little rhythms, the pulses throughout the day that are separate. And then there's the lunar rhythm. That's the beautiful rhythm involving the moon, how we are related to the, the actual moon. That's a t- we have a 28 day lunar cycle, and we know that in ancient times, all women had cycles together, and they would ovulate on the full moon. That's why a full moon was known as romantic, because at that point they were at their peak point of fertility. Their testosterone level, which is also lunar, was also at its peak, and males would would also have rhythms, and they would actually have mild rhythms of their own testosterone production. And male testosterone would also peak at the same time that females would be the most fertile and that their testosterone was peaking. So everybody would have sexual interest and then they would, you know, they would mate and then they would make babies because that's what nature wants. Nature wants people to mate and have babies. And so we actually were in alignment with our solar system. It's so, it's so amazing. We also have seasonal rhythms. So people are not the same at all times of the year. As you know, if you've ever seen the little um, Disney movie Bambi, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Yeah. All, the, all the animals, remember all the animals would have their babies in the spring. Yeah. Well, humans would have their babies in the spring too. And there's a reason for that because everything about nature is designed for maximum survival, maximum capability of reproductive success. Well, if you're going to have a baby, the best time is in the spring. So then you have the summer to fatten up the mom and the baby, and you will have enough surplus fat to get through the winter, right? So everything in nature is designed for optimal reproductive success. And everything about birth control pills is exactly against that. So birth control pills take away every rhythm a woman has, every single rhythm. And these rhythms are essential for not just reproductive success, but for mental health, for bone and connective tissue development, for cardiovascular system development, for the maintenance of the intestinal system, for bladder health, vaginal health, vision health, every, because that's even part of the brain. So for example, women on birth control pills have higher rates of autoimmune diseases, such as lupus, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Crohn's disease. It alters the way their immune system works, which are also very rhythmic. As well, it changes their brain function. So women on birth control pills are more prone to depression, anxiety, and even suicide. Um, and Women on birth control pills are more prone to hypertension and heart disease. That's why you would never give birth control pill to women who are smokers, to a woman who just had a heart attack or a stroke. If they're so good for you, why wouldn't you say, oh my God, you had a heart attack. Let's give you birth control pills, right? We would never do that. Women who have often will have elevations of their blood pressure when they're on, they're on birth control pills. Birth control pills are for metabolic dysfunction. 
They're not for metabolic homeostasis, for human health harmony. <clears throat> so they're the exact opposite. So let's look at women with polycystic ovary syndrome. I just told you all the things that they can do in any woman. By the way, the peak bone growth years are the late teens, in the teens. 20, actually, 25% of bone in a woman is developed in the first two years after her first period. And most of the bone is laid down in the teen years and into the early 20s. By the time a woman hits 25, about 90% of her bone has already been made and about 10% more by the age of 30, and then she's done. And the peak bone developing years are often the years that women are on oral contraceptives, which is horrendous. You can't go back and fix this, not ever. And bone is not optional. Healthy bone is not an option for a healthy woman. Bone is not just the scaffolding that keeps us from being like a, a jellyfish on the floor. You know, It does that, which is critical. Over half of women have fragility or osteoporotic fractures in their lives, which can cause them to die, and the morbidity is huge. But bone is even more than that. Bone, we now understand, is an endocrine organ. It makes a hormone called osteocalcin, which actually regulates glucose, which of course is such a problem in women with polycystic ovary syndrome. So bone is about glucose metabolism, regulation. It also helps with brain function, brain health. That's how important bone is. It also regulates testosterone. So all the things that are essential for the health of a woman and are all compromised in women with polycystic ovary syndrome are essential if by having strong bones. And we're giving women who are essentially desperate to have strong bones, we're giving them something that is going to keep them from having strong bones for their entire lives. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome have more arthritis. They have more inflammation everywhere and also in their joints. Estrogen is essential for collagen function and the matrix of bone, which is made out of a collagen fiber. If you don't have estrogen, you cannot make proper collagen and your ligaments and tendons will not be properly formed. So as you get a little bit older, you're more likely to have chronic pain back pain, neck pain, joint pains. And we don't even have great ways to fix this. So it's so essential that women of all ages, of all types, try to avoid oral contraceptives. And I say similars. Similars are like implantables, the um, progestin IUD, all these things. Anything that's going to alter their ability to have the beautiful rhythms that women need with their hormones to sustain and grow all the tissues of their bodies. And women with PCOS are essentially vulnerable, high, highly vulnerable to all these issues, more so than the average woman. And why is that? Because women with polycystic ovary syndrome have malfunction of their estrogen receptors. This is a key and amazing new understanding. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome are a group of women who, if you go back to ancient times, actually had a survival advantage. They have a little defect and they tend to not convert testosterone into estrogen quite as well as the average woman, but they do it well enough if you go back in ancient times. They did it well enough to actually have families, to be healthy, beautiful, wonderful, you know, perfect women, but they did have slightly higher testosterone levels because all estrogen comes from testosterone. Ovaries make testosterone for the purpose of having testosterone and also for the purpose of converting most of that testosterone into estradiol. All of that takes place in the ovaries. So if you have a little defect where you make the testosterone, it's not as well converted into estradiol, you'll have a little bit less estrogen and a little bit more testosterone. And that's what women naturally genetically have who have polycystic ovary syndrome. But nowadays, it's become extreme because in a, in a world of endocrine disruptors, chemicals, and I mentioned birth control pills are endocrine disruptors. A lot of pharmaceuticals are endocrine disruptors, but then we have other chemicals in our society that are not treated as pharmaceuticals. They're plastics. They're scents, they're, they're phthalates, they're parabens, they're heavy metals. 
uh, their flame retardants and anti-stick and anti-stain and all these things, and they all act as endocrine disruptors. They get into our bodies and they basically muck up the way natural hormones work in all these many, many different ways. And of course, it can be very complex because it can involve more hormones than just estrogen. But estrogen is sort of like the primary one of women and it is not functioning properly. The receptors are not working properly. So now you have a woman who has some defect, inherent defect in making estrogen, and it's being magnified, magnified so much that she really isn't able to make estrogen, and the estrogen that she has isn't working properly. The last thing that you wanna do is take a woman who is having trouble making estrogen or having estrogen function properly, and then put an endocrine disruptor into her body. <clears throat> because then she will have massive exaggerated problems of all the things I mentioned. That's women with PCOS. So women with PCOS are more likely to have hypertension and glucose dysregulation. When you take women with PCOS and then you put them on birth control pills, you're just exaggerating all the problems that every other woman would have on birth control pills. So she'll have less well-developed bones and joint tissue and brain health, and women with polycystic ovary syndrome are already prone to all the things that birth control pills would do to you because birth control pills disrupt your hormones and your rhythms. So if you think about it, women with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome are more prone to autoimmune disease. They're more prone to gut problems like irritable bowel syndrome. They're more prone to mood disorders. They're more prone to hypertension and glucose dysregulation, all the things that birth control pills will do to any woman. And they're only given to young women because young women, like we'll say healthy young women, have a lot of built-in resilience and reserve. So what you're doing is you're pushing them into a premature aging situation, the results of which won't be seen for maybe another 10, 20, 30 years. But nobody seems to care. You know, it's kicking the, the can down the road. So the fact that a woman can tolerate it now, but she will pay the price later, they just don't seem to care. And of course, some women pay the price right now when they're on birth control pills by having very severe depression, anxiety, and even suicidal thoughts, and a lot of gut problems. So a lot of women have a lot of problems while they're on it, even when they're young. But they'll go to a doctor and they'll say, oh, you have depression, here's your antidepressant. Oh my God, get her off the birth control pill. And then the other thing I want to mention is clotting. So birth control pills, estrogen, this is a very key point because a lot of people, they mix up estrogen and endocrine disruptors. They think they're one and the same. They'll say, you have too much estrogen in your body. No, you have too much endocrine disruptor in your body. <laughs> That's not estrogen. It's not estrogen. So stop blaming the evil twin. That's not estrogen. So real estrogen is actually anti-blood clotting. Real estrogen reduces a woman's risk of blood clotting. Now, if you are on birth control pills, you have an increased risk of blood clotting because it's not estrogen. Now, if you're a woman with PCOS because you don't have proper levels of estrogen and you don't have proper function of estrogen, you are at increased clotting risk. If you add birth control pills into the mix, you have an even higher risk, and this has been now published. So women on birth control pills who are also PCOS women have an even higher level of risk for getting a blood clot. That is completely unacceptable. We don't give women who are smokers birth control pills because we understand that they are inherently at a higher risk. We wouldn't give a woman who had a heart attack birth control pills for the same reason. What the heck are we doing giving women with polycystic ovary syndrome birth control pills? But of course, I don't think any woman should be given birth control pills because just because a woman can tolerate it better because she doesn't have the underlying risks at that moment, we're creating additional risk for her and we're creating great harm that she will experience in terms of really what is premature aging. We know that if a woman goes through premature menopause, she will have accelerated aging and all that brings with it. You know, everything that you can think of that happens to a person who's old happens to a woman at a younger age if she loses her ovarian function. When we're giving women birth control pills, basically we're doing the same thing. And this is a mega industry, but it cannot be too big to fail. It can't be because we can't poison every woman because the industry has been established. We even 
if we have to go back to the drawing board to square one and say, you know what, we have no good contraceptives. We don't. We now understand that reproduction and metabolic health, which is the force of life, are one in a woman. We can't poison reproduction and not poison the whole woman. It's one in the same. We have no good contraceptives. We have to go back to square one and start over and find things that are appropriate and safe. Then so be it. That's what we have to do. We just have to be truthful about what has been done and what is being done to women the entire world over. And, and this has to stop. I agree. And having PCOS myself, I know how easy it is to just take the pill and you're, you're told that all, all the symptoms that you're experiencing will go away. Your periods will normalize and regulate. Your skin will clear up. So anyone would go for that if the other option was to suffer with those symptoms. And the side effects that many doctors tell patients, if they tell anything at all, is going to be the slight increased risk of stroke and slight increased risk of breast cancer, but definitely not the hair loss and the anxiety and the depression and gut health problems that are commonly experienced too. You're never told anything like that. And when it comes to estrogen, it's quite commonly misunderstood. Like you mentioned that a lot of people these days are blaming things on estrogen dominance, especially in PCOS. Do you think that estrogen dominance is real or is it all due to the endocrine disruptors that are the problem or the, the low progesterone that's the problem? What are your thoughts on that? I'm so glad you asked because I want to pull my hair out when I hear the expression estrogen dominance. So here's foundational information that every woman with PCOS needs to know. They have less estrogen, not more estrogen than the average woman. They have lower FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which is the hormone that triggers the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. They have less of it. they function of aromatase, the enzyme that converts testosterone into estradiol in the ovary, is less functional. They make less estrogen. And then on top of that, they have estrogen dysfunction of their receptors. So they, they don't, the estrogen that they do have is not functioning properly. It's not maximally functioning. So they basically are living in a body that is estrogen deficient. An estrogen deficient woman will have accelerated aging. That's why they've even done studies. Women with polycystic ovary syndrome tend to have shorter telomeres. Telomeres are part of what they call the lifeline. And the longer your telomeres, the better. And women with PCOS tend to have shorter telomeres. It's really like a state of accelerated aging, which we must recognize because birth control pills actually create that same effect in women in you know, an artificial way. So women with PCOS have reduced estrogen. They certainly don't have estrogen dominance. First of all, that whole expression should be thrown out the window. What the heck does it mean? What does it mean? Most people think it means you have too much estrogen production, which of course women with PCOS do not have. They have too little. Now, if you say, well, they have more estrogen than progesterone, well, yes, because progesterone is only produced in the ovary after ovulation. Since most women with PCOS have dysfunctional ovaries and they're not ovulating, that's why they don't have normal lunar rhythms, they're not having regular menstrual cycles, then yes, of course they have less progesterone. So if you want to say there's an imbalance with their hormones, well, of course, I think we all know that, right? Any woman who isn't having regular menstrual cycles is having hormonal problems, right? Because otherwise things would be the way it should be. So in terms of estrogen dominance, that whole expression should go out the, the window. Women with PCOS do tend to have more endocrine disruptors on board. There have been some studies showing that women with PCOS probably because of a whole myriad of things, maybe some genetic predisposition, gut inflammation, which we can talk about. The gut is very, the gut microbiome, the microbes that live in the, the gut is, are really abnormal in women with polycystic ovary syndrome, which is related a lot to having abnormal estrogen function. So that, that creates its own problems in the liver and in the gut, because that's where estrogen is what we call biotransformed or detoxified. 
but I hate to use in a way the word detoxified because it makes it sound like estrogen is a toxin, when of course it is not. So the real word is biotransformation. It's altered so that it can go from being fat soluble to water soluble so that it can be excreted in the feces and out with the, uh, the poop, right? So, and, and that's a natural process for eliminating old hormones in the body. So women with PCOS, because they often have abnormal liver functions, often very high rates of fatty liver and other dysfunctions with the liver, because that's related to the gut and they don't have healthy guts, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of irritable bowel and other gut problems. And that leads to having the wrong microbes. And there's this amazing group of microbes in the gut called the estrobilome. They're actual microbes designed to alter estrogen for the purpose of elimination, but also for the purpose of recycling, because some estrogen does get recycled and that's appropriate. It's supposed to be a nice, normal balance. Everything should be done the way it's supposed to happen, but it isn't happening that way. So women with PCOS can have dysfunction with estrogen elimination. And I'm going to use the word detoxify, but recognizing, please, estrogen is not a toxin. That's really not the right word. It's biotransformation, but people don't know that word. But for the elimination of estrogen, there are some problems in women with, with this, uh, with polycystic ovary syndrome. So that, but that's a, so they may have some abnormal metabolites of estrogen circulating because they don't go through the proper phase one, two, and three detoxification, I'll use that word, process to eliminate estrogen. But that is, you have to understand what that is. It's not because they make too much estrogen, it's because their detoxification pathways are malfunctioning because of not having enough estrogen. And then the thing that really sort of tips the scales against them is our Western diets. The Western diet really has taken polycystic ovary syndrome and turned it into a worldwide epidemic because once upon a time, you know, in ancient times, women with PCOS were fine. In fact, they, prob they not only were fine, they actually had a survival advantage because by making a little bit of extra testosterone, it turned them into stronger women. They were bolder, braver, um, you know, they, they were the adventurous ones. We now know that Women in the Olympics, the gold medalists, they have a much higher percentage of women who are PCOS. So PCOS made women brave and strong and bold and still fertile, just slightly reduced fertility. But now with our unbelievably crappy Western diets, with all the endocrine disruptors, with the lack of nutrients, all the chemicals in the food that are destroying the microbes and changing the microbiomes of our gut, the women are now being pushed into the state of chronic inflammation because by not having proper estrogen function and not having proper estrogen production in their ovaries, everything is magnified. Everything goes much worse. So what was a minor problem suddenly becomes a major problem. And so women with PCOS do not have estrogen dominance. They have poor estrogen production, poor estrogen function, and lots of endocrine disruptors because they're, it's not that they're exposed to more endocrine disruptors than the average woman, which is way too much. You know, we live in a pool of endocrine disruptors. I hate to say this, but I call it poison world. You know, that's what we live in now, to be honest. And women with polycystic ovary syndrome are not as good as eliminating these chemicals, these toxins from our bodies. So we tend to bioaccumulate more. So our toxic load, that's the expression we use, our toxic load is higher than other women. So that makes things even that much worse. So we have a lot of, you know, the cards stacked against us, but we can overcome this. And that's why I don't want this to be all sounding doom and gloom, because there really is hope. I can't go back and redo what exposures you've had earlier in your life, in utero, I can't change your genetics, I can't do any of that. But even with those limitations, there is so much that women with PCOS can do to actually have such better health, such, a much, such an improved quality of life to improve their fertility. And by improving their fertility, they're improving their overall health. So even if a woman doesn't want to have children, she should want to be fertile. Even the ancient people, they knew they had, they worshiped fertility gods because they understood that fertility was health itself. 
And so we've got to throw this term estrogen dominance in the garbage can, close the lid and take it away. <laughs> yeah, and I've, I do admit I've been in the past using that term myself because that's kind of what we're taught and that's what everyone is saying these days. But I love your approach to things where we don't actually utilize estrogen properly and we don't have enough. We're actually deficient in some ways in estrogen, but it's just the fact that we can't detoxify it well that can cause maybe some of the symptoms that we experience and I like to think of women with PCOS as being like canaries in the coal mine in the fact that (laughs) a lot of the endocrine disruptors are affecting us all but we're the sensitive ones who kind of show the negative effects and the side effects first and yeah we can display a lot of the harmful effects that may appear for other women later on in life so Um, My next question would be, it's kind of a two-part question. Um, How do you increase estrogen naturally? Would you do that through phytoestrogens? Would you do that through any lifestyle practices? And the second part would be, if a woman with PCOS is looking for treatment and she doesn't want to go on the birth control pill or she's looking to stop the birth control pill, what, what are her options? What would you do? what would be the foundational steps to take in order to start to manage some of the PCOS symptoms? Oh, all wonderful questions. So one of the foundational pieces of information that all of you must know is that the circadian rhythm is ruled initially, the first line of control is in the brain in an area called the hypothalamus. And there's an area called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which sits atop the optic nerve. And there are actually receptors in the eye that can sense light and dark. And these receptors have nerve pathways that go straight to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, to, which is where the master clock of the body sits. We now know that about one third of all the genes in our bodies are clock genes, but about 90% of the genes in our bodies are related in some way to clock genes. So basically, for close to all the genes in our bodies are in some way controlled by time. And it turns out that estrogen is the master of the master clock. So women with PCOS do have dysfunction of this master clock which makes them essentially living a life of jet lag because the master clock puts out signals through different ways, um, through the vagus nerve, through hormonal signaling and such to notify all the different cells of the body as to what time it is. It's like an orchestra. Now, the conductor is like the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the master clock, and by keeping the beat, it keeps all the instruments playing the exact note at exactly the right time at exactly the right intensity, right? So if you lose your conductor or your conductor becomes drunk and then suddenly the, the violins are off by one note or you know the, the cellos are playing a different measure, suddenly all turns into noise, right? It's so complex. So think of the body like the most amazing, complex symphony ever created. And the brain is the conductor keeping every organ working on beat. When you think of it, there are all these organs in the body. How does any of this work? How does it work together? You know, it's, it's amazing. And the master is in the clock. And the master of the clock is estrogen. And now you know. Women with PCOS don't have proper functioning of their estrogen, so they don't have proper functioning of the master clock. So most people know that people who have jet lag have medical problems. So we know, for example, that women who work the night shift, say they're nurses working at night, they have much higher rates of depression, diabetes, weight gain, sleep dysfunction, and so on. In fact, there was a study of just eight days where they flipped the circadian rhythm of people where they had 12 noon become 12 midnight and just for just eight days. They did this to them. And at the end of eight days, their insulin level went up 22%. Their sleep efficiency went down 20%. And of course, they gained weight. So you have women with PCOS essentially living a life of jet lag. So think of it. Women who work at night, 
they have higher rates of diabetes and insulin resistance, just like women with PCOS. They have sleep problems, just like women with PCOS. They have more depression and anxiety, just like women with PCOS. So one of the tactics I take is to work to try to get the circadian rhythm right for women with PCOS, because we can't just automatically, like I said, change the endocrine disruptors that they've previously been exposed to, the ones that are currently in their body, we have to work to get them out. So what we have to do is try to get the body to work better, recognizing that women with PCOS in the olden days lived perfectly normal lives. So we have to try to get back to where we were. So we do the very best we can. The first step is to try to get the circadian rhythm back online because without that, for example, most women, the majority, 80%, have weight problems with PCOS. Well, I just told you that just eight days of circadian rhythm dysfunction will cause 22% increase in insulin. Oh my goodness, If you, what insulin does in the body is amazing, but it promotes fat deposition and fat storage and fat creation. If you have high insulin, you cannot lose weight. It's just simple. You can't lose weight if you have high insulin. The body will prohibit it. So you've got to get that insulin down. Well, if you live in chronic jet lag, you can't. So what we want to do is use what are called the peripheral clocks. It turns out that our bodies are equipped with what I call, you know, like a fail safe, right? A backup. So every cell in the body has its own clocks as well as getting signals from the master clock. So how can we help since we don't know exactly right off the bat how to fix the master clock, what can we do to work with the peripheral clocks? Well, they can tell what time it is by timed eating. It turns out that the microbes that live in our gut, they're bacteria. They have clocks. It turns out every living creature and every cell on this planet has clock genes. In fact, the discoverers of the clock genes won the Nobel Prize for Medicine back in 2017. That was just around the corner, right? We said, just got it. These were only discovered in the 1990s and we've been learning about it ever since. It's probably one of the most amazing and critical discoveries in the history of mankind was understanding that we have this issue with clock genes. So what we can, recognizing that the clock genes of the microbes, they do not know if it's light or dark, but they know if there's food or not. So we can actually program the clock genes by timed eating. And then by doing that, the, the microbes put out signals through the production of short chain fatty acids. These are fermentation products that are made by the gut. And these fermentation products, particularly butyrate, but also propionate and acetate, they go to the liver and the liver is the metabolic powerhouse of the body, the metabolic area for detoxification of estrogen and for almost all of the metabolic signals and also for glucose regulation. So by properly timing the microbes, by properly timing our food intake, we can actually help to reset the clocks of the gut and of the liver and we can help get metabolism back on track for women. So when you have an out of control clock situation in the liver, which is what women with PCOS have, the liver goes into a state of uncontrolled gluconeogenesis. That means the production of sugar with no feedback, no control, no reason whatsoever why the liver should be pouring out glucose, but it does. The liver makes glucose and it's pouring it out. So women with PCOS not only have insulin resistance and high levels of insulin, they also have uncontrolled production of sugar from their livers and also fat, the triglycerides. But by timed eating, by eating at very fixed intervals, which I'll tell you, we, we can actually help to reset the clocks in the liver and reset the entire metabolic state of that woman. And this is huge. There was a study out of Israel not very long ago that showed that women with PCOS, when they ate two thirds of their calories for breakfast and one third for lunch, which leaves nothing, but they actually had a tiny, tiny little early dinner, in just one month, their insulin and testosterone levels fell by 50% or more. There's no drug that does that. And this is happening naturally. This is an amazing discovery all about timing, 
They've done studies with people. You can eat the same food at night and gain weight versus eating the same food in the morning and losing weight. So it's so important to understand that our bodies are on timers. Our insulin works best and is produced most robustly in the earlier part of the day. So some people think, I'm going to fast. So I'll have a dinner and then I won't eat until the afternoon. And they're, not, they're fasting through breakfast. I'm sorry, but that's idiotic. That is totally against everything the body is designed for. You do not want to do that. It's terrible. So I repeat, do not skip breakfast. Remember the study. If you eat a very high intake of food for breakfast, you will then have a very reduced level of insulin. That is such an important take-home message. So I hope that you will all eat a very big breakfast. Now, it's not just, of course, when you eat it, it's also what you eat. And you mentioned like phytoestrogens. Now, unfortunately, when you have the wrong gut microbiome, and about 50% of people will have the wrong gut microbiome to properly process organic soy, but we don't know who that is. But so I recommend that first take a, a month and go on what I call a reset diet, where you take out all the foods, even good foods, that people tend to have inflammation or allergic reactions to. And unfortunately, that does include soy, because you know, it includes a lot of things that people can eat that are healthy, but tend to be allergic in some people like nuts, you know, nuts are very healthy, but there are a lot of people that have now nut allergies. So we take out that sort of thing. So you do sort of an elimination diet, and that includes removing soy, but then I would put it back, organic whole soy, that is soy that is not mimicking something else, not soy that is like, um, you know, pretending to be cheese or pretending to be turkey or bacon, none of that. It has to be organic whole soy, like the, the beans themselves, the edamame, the tofu, the miso, the tempeh, okay? That type of thing. You eat whole organic soy. It actually binds to estrogen receptor beta. So there are three estrogen receptors, alpha, beta, and then there's the membrane receptors. And they have very complex interplay with each other. Then the estrogen receptors of the gut lining there are estrogen receptors everywhere. Every organ in the body has estrogen receptors because remember, estrogen is the master hormone of females. It's the master hormone of our master clock and it sets and rules everything. So remember, it's all about reproductive success. So estrogen, of course, is involved in reproduction, but it's involved in everything because the whole body of a woman has to be healthy if she's gonna be successfully getting pregnant, being pregnant, having babies, nursing them, and then raising them, right? So she has to have a healthy body in its in entirety. So estrogen is the master of everything. The lining cells of the gut have predominantly estrogen receptor beta, which it turns out that phytoestrogens bind to. So eating organic soy for a very significant percentage of women can help to heal the gut and also can then improve the gut function, the gut microbial population, and then in turn help to heal the, the liver as well. So we definitely want to try that and see how it goes. But recognizing that because our gut microbes are not right, some people can't properly metabolize it to create the, the binding receptor function that we want. So, and flaxseed as well is also another good phytoestrogen. So I definitely recommend that. And I recommend whole husk psyllium because that's a wonderful soluble fiber that is also wonderful for the gut. So every woman with PCOS, if she's truly highly motivated, and I know our society does not support this at all. We're totally into eating all our food at the end of the day and tons of it. But if you can have the fortitude and resolution to eat a big breakfast and then a medium lunch and then a tiny dinner, that is the best for you. If you can't compromise, have a big breakfast, a tiny lunch, and then a moderate dinner. But try to have the dinner early. Our pancreas goes to sleep by eight o'clock, but you should really stop eating by seven. You should have a 13 hour fast from dinner to breakfast. And you always have to have breakfast by two hours after you get up. You don't have to have breakfast the minute you wake up, but you should definitely have breakfast by 10 o'clock in the morning for sure. Okay, do not say I'm going to have a fast and go to one o'clock. Do not do that unless you're trying to harm yourself. And <laughs> I know you don't want to do that. So that is also 
very, very important. It turns out that exercising in the afternoon helps to build more muscle. And that is also very important. Muscle is an, a very important organ as far as regulating and controlling metabolism of glucose. And women with PCOS have inherent insulin resistance because they make so much insulin. And because when you have inflammation, and women with PCOS have inflamed guts, they have the wrong microbes living there, so they have lots of leaky gut, and their immune cells have estrogen receptors too. Everybody's immune cells do. But because the estrogen isn't functioning properly and there isn't enough of it, the immune cells are dysregulated in women with PCOS. And this was published in the 1990s that the immune cells of women, the innate immune cells, like the mast cells, which are the first responders for invaders like bacteria, parasites, viruses, they are hypersensitive. So it takes very little to set them off. And mast cells contain tremendous amounts of pre-made inflammatory products like tumor necrosis factor alpha and histamine and such. And so they explode much more readily. So we have these little time bombs in us that explode. They're designed to protect us against invaders, but they explode with the least little provocation in women with PCOS. And it creates this state of chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation creates insulin resistance and insulin resistance up to our IGF-1, our insulin growth factor one, which then triggers the production of more testosterone in our ovaries. So it's a very vicious cycle. So we have to cut it off at the base by eating natural foods. I call it organic farm to table. Now, I say organic because if you eat chemical foods, I mean, in the U.S., it's a disaster. We pour poison over all our food, and then we serve it to everyone. It's so bizarre. Like, who thought it was a good idea to put poison on our food? You know, we kill living things with pesticides and herbicides, and then what are we, not living things? You know, and then we feed it to ourselves. It's so bizarre. So you have to eat organic. I don't care if you have to buy used clothes, used furniture, you know, whatever. You have to buy food. It's the foundation of your body's functioning and everything. So you have to buy organic food. I know people say, but I can't afford it. You have to afford it. I don't care where you save money elsewhere. You know, you have to save, do not buy a new car, you know, share, drive, you know, share a ride, whatever you have to do, you have to get proper food into you. Okay. You can't compromise food. So you have to get organic food and stop eating out. Okay. Save that money. Most people eat out so much. Just stop eating out, you know? Have people over your home for entertainment, right? Old-fashioned. So it's organic farm to table. What are you cutting out? The factory. You don't eat factory-made food, period. That's it. There's no tolerance. Zero, like, you're not going to eat heroin or cocaine, right? So that's zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for factory food. That's it. It's poison. You cannot tolerate it. It's destroying your gut. You're already in trouble. So. The only foods that I say can come from a factory are for packaging. So it's, you know, because what are you going to do? How are you going to get lima beans? Go to the lima bean farm. So it's only packaging, right? And you try to get the best packaging you can. You know, if you can get something in a glass jar, it's better than in a can because cans are filled with bisphenol A as the liner. Canned goods are bad, okay? So try to get it in a glass jar. So I don't mind if you buy organic stewed tomatoes. That's one ingredient. I'll call it mildly processed, or you get mustard. Like, how am I going to get you mustard, right? So you get organic mustard. You get organic ketchup. I don't expect you to be able to make everything at home, but everything you can make at home, you get all the raw ingredients, organic farm to, to your home. You make everything from scratch. Think a thousand years ago. They didn't have factory food. They didn't have PCOS rampant all over the world like we have today. You have little, you know, resilience when it comes to this stuff. You cannot tolerate chemicals in your food. So it's all organic farm to table. You have to make your own stuff, you know, make it fun. You know, it's actually very calming to touch vegetables. You know, it really is. Fruit and vegetables, touching it, cutting it, smelling it. It's wonderful. Optimal. I know this is going to sound crazy. 9 to 12 cups of vegetables measured raw every day. Vegetables are magic foods. I use supplements. I use plenty of supplements, and I can tell you what I recommend, but they are supplements. Food is foundational. 
you can't supplement your way into health. You have to stay with first the healthy diet, okay? And you've got to get sleep. So you want to eat those magic vegetables, organic, and you eat what they call across the colors of the rainbow, purples and greens and oranges and yellows, because they all have those magical polyphenols and all the antioxidants that you need desperately. Of course, everybody does, but you need it extra. And you, in the beginning, I recommend you go vegan because you have the wrong microbiomes. You cannot process animal protein. I'm not a long-term vegan person. I recommend small amounts of the healthiest animals you can find. There is no good animals anymore, but you get the healthiest ones you can find, but not for at least six months. You really should, you know, if you're really very mildly PCOS, you may be three months, but you can't process animal protein. You actually make nitrosoamines, which are carcinogens, carcinogens. You make TMAO, which is a very bad toxin in your gut. So you do not want to eat animal in the beginning. Um, you can get plenty of protein. There are now elite athletes who are vegans, okay? And that, what did they do? You, of course, always have to take B vitamin supplements, but that's part of my protocol as well. And they should be methylated because we don't know what your SNPs are, your single nucleotide polymorphisms like MTHFR, these kinds of things. We don't know your genetics for how you can use you know, chemical vitamins like folic acid. So I say avoid them. That's not a real vitamin. That's a synthetic junk that you would never find naturally in the body. Many people cannot process it. And so you really want to you know, avoid those kinds of vitamins. But if you go vegan and you eat a high fiber diet, now what's a lot of people say, oh, starch, it turns into sugar. No, it doesn't. Sugar turns into sugar. Processed carbs like bread and flakes, you know, corn flakes, puffed wheat, those kinds of things turn into sugar. If you eat a yam, if you're eating root vegetables, um, they don't just turn into sugar. They actually are food for your gut microbes. Remember, the gut microbes are living creatures. They need to be repaired. You have a damaged gut microbe. You know, they, they really need to be nurtured and you need to care for them. The care and feeding of your gut microbiome is essential to the restoration of your PCOS um, body. And so you need to feed and nurture them by giving them the fiber that they need. In ancient times, the people ate between one and one and a half grams, uh, or rather uh, at least 100 grams, what am I saying? 100 to 150 grams of fiber. The typical American now eats like eight grams. So that's a huge reduction in grams of fiber. And they'll say, oh, you know, we'll just aim for 25. That's not what you need. You need to get back up to like 100. But I'm not going to tell you to do it in one day because you, you will probably feel very funny in your tummy because that's more fiber than you're used to. So you may have to work your way up. But the goal is to really try to get way up there on fiber intake. And you do that through eating natural fibers. And whole grains are great fibers, beans and lentils. But when I say whole grains, it means it's still in the whole grain format, like buckwheat. Buckwheat increases myo-inositol, which helps regulate your cycles and lowers blood sugar. There has been studies that show that in just one month of eating a very high fiber diet, we're talking 70% carbohydrates. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I have to be on a low carb diet. Oh no, that's the worst diet you can be on. You need to feed your gut microbes. You need to restore your microbiome. So you need to have a very high fiber. Fiber is carbs, okay? Carbs are not evil. Only process garbage carbs, just like trans fat is evil, but omega-3 is not evil. You can't lump, you know, it's like endocrine disruptors are not estrogen. They're, they're evil, but estrogen is not evil. Estrogen is wonderful. We're just lumping things and we're mislabeling things and we're talking about things incorrectly. So carbs are what vegetables are. Whole grains are carbs. Fiber and starch are carbs. Resistant starch, like cold potatoes. If you cook potatoes and then you eat a cold potato salad with like a vinaigrette, that won't turn to any sugar in your body. That's pure food for your microbes. Plantain, green bananas. So these will not turn into even any sugar. They're pure food for your microbiome. And there are studies that show that a 70% whole food, you know, not processed food, whole food carb diet, 70% in one month, you can reverse early diabetes, you can dramatically lower your blood sugar, your insulin. So if you combine that with the breakfast, big breakfast program I described, and you combine that with the very high carb diet, with the all fiber, all 
organic and all whole foods, you can have such a huge impact. You'll see the weight finally starting to come off. That will enable you to lose weight because your insulin will come down, your blood sugars will become low, but in a normal way and normalized. And suddenly your body will start to metabolize estrogen properly. And then you won't have the problems you'll have that you've been having and things are going to start looking brighter. And then once you get into that, we can actually then add in some periodic fasting where, and we're going to be starting a study using the fasting mimicking diet, which was developed at the Longevity Institute at USC very shortly, because if you stop eating and just have water for four days, which is almost undoable for most people, or you do the fasting mimicking diet where you're eating what I call stealth food. It's not a lot of food, but it's enough to help keep you going. And it's for five days, you get the same benefit as if you water fasted for four. So they created um, a product out of this called Prolon for promoting longevity. So it's actually a commercially available product, Prolon, and it's food that you eat for five days. It's real food, minimally processed, just like dehydrated and nut bars, but it has almost no protein in it because protein triggers the nutrient sensor called mTOR. So it flies under the radar of your body detecting food. How amazing is that? It's food that your body doesn't see. So it's called it stealth food. So you get to eat for five days. You know, it's not a huge amount because it's stealth food, but you get, but you get a breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So you're not feeling like you're starving and you get the benefit is if you've water fasted. What that does is it's like a complete reboot to your circadian clock and to your gut microbes. It's dramatic. It lowers inflammation. It reduces blood pressure in people who have high blood pressure. It normalizes lipids. It helps reverse autoimmune disease. And they're doing tons of studies. It improves brain health, improves mood. It's amazing. Actually, um, today is Sunday. On Friday, I finished my 14th course of Prolon myself because I try to practice what I preach. You know, I, I was one of the people that was a lean, I was a lean PCOS. So I was lucky in that regard. But I had to have fertility treatments for my first baby. My largest baby weighed nine pounds, six ounces. I had glucose dysregulation. I had horrible acne for so much of my life. So believe me, I feel whatever you're feeling, I feel your pain too. I get it, okay? The only thing I didn't have was the obesity part. You know, I had everything else and I get it. And so, you know, I have to practice what I preach. So I try to do all the things I tell you. And, you know, so, you know, and there are certain supplements like um, myo-inositol and NAC and sometimes melatonin and quercetin. I'm a consultant and medical advisor for the nutraceutical company Pure Encapsulations. So I designed several different protocols for them for many different female specific problems, including PCOS. It's a little um, confusing because uh, they can't actually say PCOS because it's a nutraceutical company. So it's under like ovarian health. <laughs> you know, that's, you have to use these buzzwords. And as well, I have my first book that's out. It's already out. It's uh, available on Amazon. And I hope that if you have PCOS that you might want to buy it and read it because um, it goes into much more depth about my program and the science, I think I have over 500 references. I'm very into evidence-based medicine. Everything I do is, is based on actual data and science. And so the name of my book is PCOS SOS, A Gynecologist's Lifeline to Naturally Restore Your Hormones, Rhythms, no, no Your Rhythms, Hormones, and Happiness. No, no, wait a minute. Your <laughs> I kept going back and forth. To naturally store, it's all the same. To naturally store your Hormones, rhythms, and happiness. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> like can't if you remember PCOS SOS, and yes. it'll be out in um, you know a physical format by uh, mid February. Yeah, now it's, it's a great, up. a great catchy title. <laughs> People are going to remember it. that one. <laughs> right, just remember PCOS SOS. Yeah, <laughs> that's the I'm best. I'm sure part. they'll find it. Yeah, or just search your name on Google. I'm sure it'll appear. If you search my name on Google, you can find um, a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's true. <laughs>
and I've been waiting for your book to come out since I heard you speak in September. So I think Finally. I, I, I emailed you as well, uh, I think a couple of months ago, asking, is it out yet? Is it out yet? Because, yeah, I'm just like obsessed with your wisdom and just your approach to things, as I already mentioned. It's been an amazing interview and I could have you here for another three hours, but I know that you're really busy. So I just want to end with just a few quick questions so that the people listening can get to know you a little bit better because I'm sure they fell in love with you after listening to this like I did the first time. So the first question would be, I know that you mentioned about breakfast being really important and a lot of people these days are getting it totally wrong by doing the fasting in the morning and then drinking a bulletproof coffee and doing fasted exercise and then eating all of the calories after 8 p.m. at night, which is totally wrong, like you mentioned, for PCOS. So what did you have for breakfast this morning? And how do you start your day with your morning routine? Well, uh, maybe I should tell you yesterday, because it's Sunday and I got a late start. So I'm going to have breakfast right after this. But yesterday, um, this is not typical breakfast for a lot of people. I had a whole yam. I del- it's an organic Japanese yam. It was absolutely delicious. And I had a breakfast salad. So um, I love salad. So and in my salad, I have lots of different chopped up vegetables. And I put in sunflower seeds and walnuts. And sometimes I did not yesterday, but sometimes I'll put in little bits of chicken or meat, but I didn't um, because I, I don't eat meat more than once a day. And I wasn't sure what I was going to have for, for dinner yesterday, but I turned out having a vegan dinner anyway. But, um, but, you know, so I just had a very large, what I call my breakfast salad. You know, you can get a, what they call a breakfast burrito. Have you ever heard about that? In the U.S., you can just turn anything into a breakfast food. They just throw egg into it, right? Oh. That's somehow, if you add no, egg. Have egg in the U.K. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, here, if you, um, if you go to like some of these fast food restaurants, which I don't go to. But they take any kind of food and then they, like a Mexican restaurant, um, they just throw some pieces of egg in it and they call it a breakfast burrito or a breakfast fajita or a breakfast whatever. But um, so basically everything can be a breakfast food. I don't know where we got this idea that certain foods are for breakfast or for dinner. So I just call it, if you call it, if you put the word breakfast in, then it is for breakfast, right? So I just call it a breakfast salad. Yes. And um, so that type of thing. And I could make that the night before. So I didn't actually do any cooking at all. And uh, I love um, my homemade hot cocoa, which just consists of organic cocoa powder and some organic soy milk and hot water. No, nothing else added, no sweetener, nothing else. And I think it's great. And I get some of my organic soy in. And I cocoa, when it's organic, is... You know, has a lot of polyphenols and healthy fat. So that's um, another good thing to have if you like that in the morning. And uh, so that's, that's my story. Sounds delicious. Yeah, it's really nice, especially in the UK at this time of year, to have that warm drink in the morning. What's something that you're into lately? So I know that you're big into fasting. Is there anything else that you're kind of researching at the moment that you want to share with the, with the audience listening? Well, yes, and I'm not quite sure what the status is in the UK, but I'm, my goal for 2019 is to become an expert in the use of CBD and cannabis in women because it's legal throughout a good part of the US now, not every state, but in a very high number, including my state of California. And women have no clue of its potential dangers, and some women are using it when they want to get pregnant and it can actually impair fertility, it can actually impair menstrual cycles. They're using it when they are pregnant, thinking that it's good for morning sickness. They don't understand it can induce miscarriages. It can cause preterm labor. Uh, they don't, but yet women have high levels of, women have twice the incidence of depression, pain, insomnia as men. And so they're using it in droves, but they don't know how to use it safely. So that's my current passion is to master everything about CBD and cannabis and hemp, you know, because hemp is almost all CBD, whereas cannabis has a lot of THC, which is the psychoactive component. So stand by and I'll have, we'll do a a talk on that later. 
yeah definitely can come back on the podcast and discuss <laughs> that in the future um yeah cannabis isn't legal here um but we do um have the hemp and the cbd that's becoming quite popular so that would be right. interesting to um hear about yeah and i like i like hemp because of its pure cbd yeah and final question is what's one piece of advice that you'd give to women struggling with pcos is to know that they are actually among the super women right that they have the genes that were that made women stronger and braver and more resilient you know and the superstars of the ancient world and that they are making up the majority of women who are, like I mentioned, the Olympian gold medalists. So inherently, they're fine. They simply need to restore their natural innate rhythms, get back their gut microbes into the way they should be, and they can actually move forward and have wonderful lives. Amazing. What a wonderful way to wrap up such an awesome interview. I want to thank you so much for your time and definitely recommend everyone to go out and grab the book and i'm sure they will be following your work online and heading over to the pure encapsulations website as well like you mentioned so thank you so much dr gersh for your time and i'm looking forward to speaking with you again in the future my pleasure good luck to all of you Thank you for listening to another episode of the Hormones in Harmony podcast. If you like this episode, please leave me a rating and review as this helps to spread the word to other women dealing with hormone imbalances. If you haven't already, check out my website vivanaturalhealth.co.uk and Instagram page at vivanaturalhealth for tons more free content and inspiration. You can also schedule a free 30-minute hormone troubleshooting call to find out the next steps to take in order to improve your symptoms naturally. See you back here next week for another episode.